Chapter 6 The Big Fish Even now I wonder if Charlie has forgiven me. He made a momentary mistake in a business upon which he was and prided himself to be an expert. I thoughtlessly corrected the error, and Charlie stood there dull-faced, imagining he was portrayed in the light of a new chum. We were burning the ten stone down on the beach near the camp. The kiln was the height of a man, just a box of logs with firewood lining the bottom, and so arranged that when lighted, a drop would blow through. We carried the stone down from the peak and tipped it into the box until it was full up, then piled logs on top and set fire to it underneath. It was a slow furnace. We only wanted to roast the stone. In a couple of hours, this was done. The logs had burned down, leaving a pile of whitish red stones. As this pile was cooling off, we raked it nearly flat with long sticks and threw seawater over it. The hot stone crackled and split. The mass then was quite easy to crush by simply hammering it with the flat of our picks. As we powdered the stone, the particles of tin and wolfram dropped loose. Next day, we sieved the powdered pile and separated the metal by a simple process of jigging, using sieves, shaking, and water with gravitation to separate cleanly the metal from the crushed stone. The black tin grains showed up richly. In fact, we recovered nearly half a ton of tin and a quarter of a ton of wolfram. Charlie bent over a sieve and picked out a little yellow slug of metal. My eyes had fastened on it instantly. There's gold in the peak, exclaimed Charlie excitedly. I thought all along that quartz looked gold-bearing. Look, there's a weight of gold in this piece. It is copper stain, I explained. The kiln was too hot and melted little slugs of the tin and wolfram here and there. You've noticed the copper stains on some of the quartz. There must have been a metallic speck of copper in a stone, and when this piece of tin melted, the copper melted too and ran into it, staining it just like bright gold. Charlie stood staring at the gold speck in his hand. Simple and accurate, though the explanation was Charlie was hurt. He was a thoroughly experienced gold prospector who for the best part of a lifetime had won a living by the gold he had sought and found and now a considerably less experienced and younger man had caught him out in a mistake. If he had been deceived but had found a mistake himself, all would have been well. It was no credit to me that I had grasped the solution. Years ago, as a schoolboy, I had worked in one of the greatest assay offices in the mining world, the Broken Hill Proprietary. When Charlie held up the glistening yellow speck, technical training, forgotten till that moment, flashed the solution to my mind. But Charlie never forgave, nor did he ever mention the subject again. That evening I climbed to the peak and watched the sun go down, a shimmering disk of crimson turning to molten gold. It lit up the sea with a road of rosy waves that broadened into pink ripples far towards the darkening mainland. On the very temple of the peak was built a man-high, solid cairn of rocks, either by long-forgotten castaways or some naval survey vessel. What a place to erect a flagpole on, I thought, and wondered yet again whether castaways had built the cairn for that very purpose. Charlie had given a non-committal answer the very first day we had climbed the peak. Possibly it had been built as a site for naval survey work. Whether or no, with a flagpole upon it, at this height it would be visible far to sea. Turning to retrace my steps, I saw Charlie down below on the little patch of alluvial ground where the peak base sloped to the edge of the mangrove forest. What on earth was he doing? He was digging, probably trying to locate a reef he had traced down from the side of the peak. He had dug down and found several reefs. If they had contained ten, as did the tiny leaders, we should have been made men. But where he apparently was digging now was on the only flat on the island, a tiny patch of loam that ages of weathering had washed down from the peak. 
and judging by all appearances, there was only dead coral under the loam, no hope of any mineral. In the fading light, he straightened up and walked around the base of the hill towards the camp on the lagoon side of the island. I walked to camp down through the grass, whistling to a sleepy fluttering from the tiny clump of trees clinging to the peak side. What were you doing down on the flat? I asked as Charlie bent over the fire. Digging a garden? Yes. What? You don't mean it. Yes, I do. Some of those sweet potatoes we brought along with us. I put them aside and planted them this afternoon. And I brought some vegetable seeds from Cooktown. From Cooktown? Great Scott, did you really intend to make a garden? If we stayed here, yes. It is the sensible thing to do. Anyway, I always carry seeds in my swag. If a man starts a permanent camp, he can grow a vegetable garden which means he cannot survive. But this is not going to be a permanent camp. Anyway, those sweet bucks you planted won't be eatable for three months. We won't be here then, thank goodness. Well, someone else will reap the benefit. Good heavens, who would come and live in this godforsaken hole even if it was a paradise of sweet bucks and pumpkins? I would, answered Charlie quietly. I stared as he dropped a pinch of tea in the billy and lifted it off. He cut a hunk of damper and reached for some fried fish. Our dripping was getting very low. It was too precious to use as butter now. You're joking, Charlie. No. I reached for the damper and my share of fish and chewed away, staring at the evening chasing its shadows across the unflowing waters of the lagoon. Then, you can't be in earnest, Charlie, for a man to live alone on this isolated speck of coral, granite, and mud is unbelievable. Just the wide sky by day, at night the everlasting breakers on the reef. His only companions, a few half-starved birds fluttering to the well to drink. Robinson Crusoe was never so lonely. He had a large island, a black fellow, and a pair for company. Here you would have nothing. Well, what about it? Heavens, man. Wear your sense of companionship. Don't you want to see other people to hear them talk? In, <clears throat> in the loneliest part of the bush, you can jump on a horse and in a week or two reach a town or camp. Here you would be dependent on often unfavorable winds and a passing boat that couldn't or wouldn't call. You probably would not see a fellow man once in twelve months. Not in years, unless it was for the yearly visit of that lighthouse boat, and it could not land even then if the weather was rough. Well, well, don't you ever want to see towns again, see other men and hear them talk? No, you can keep your hotbeds of disease and squalor, your wretched picture shows and artificial people. What has the world done for me? Nothing but bullocking toil to earn a crust, and all your human companionship, thanks of is, to take the other fellow down if he has money and kick him into the gutter if he hasn't. The world has no time for me. And I've got no time for the world. To hell with the world. That night, sitting out on the big black rock, Charlie fished the night through and didn't catch a fish. The old man grouper came and took two hooks. We knew instantly it was the old man by the way he swam out with the taunting line. Then, without the least haste or flurry, turned and swam against our strength deeper down under the rocks and calmly broke the line. His great jaws must have been studded with hooks, but the monstrous mouth would hardly feel such prickles. Charlie fished grimly. We had hardly spoken since the evening meal. I wish the catch would come. Charlie, by all the signs, was accumulating gas again. I longed to ask if he had used the scope that day, but dared not. Crouched there with the line between his fingers, his eyes glaring at the water, he evidently was awaiting some such question as he was awaiting the bite of the fish. But the old man grouper would not bite at the shark line, although it was baited so temptingly. Charlie again and again maneuvered the bait to swim just before where he judged the mouth of the cavern to be. The fish ignored the line. We were on our last few hooks now. They had served their purpose and saved our tens of meat. With that and the extra flour and several other extras Charlie's forethought had ordered together with the little gift of 
from the lighthouse steamer we had sufficient to last until the catch arrived. The ten of Wolfram was all bagged and lying ready by the beach. It would mean only a matter of moments for us to pull down the tent and pack up once we decided to catch. There was nothing to do but wait. It was perishingly cold there on the rock. I jumped from boulder to boulder, then walked on the mangrove roots above the water to the shore for the blanket. Returning, I rolled up in the blanket beside the silently fishing Charlie, gazed up at the stars and fell asleep. Next morning, Charlie was sitting hunched up by the campfire, his eyes bloodshot, his mouth sullen. He snarled when I inquired if I could do anything for him.